Right. So, I mean, I think uh, at least a lot of libertarians, uh, and, I, and I don't want to make any sweeping generalizations here, but at least a lot of them would allow for cases where you're, you're sort of backed into a corner um, because, let's say, you're in tremendous debt or something like that. Um, and so it would seem that you don't really have any options. But, and if the option came up, well, sell yourself into slavery and all your debt will be taken care of and your kids will be taken care of as well then um, that would still be an option, that would still be a choice. And so, I, and, and I agree with you, I think that's a problem because, I mean, it's not necessarily coercion, but you're certainly, um, it is coercive in the sense because you your options are there, but they're very limited and it's not really a choice at all, right? Uh, uh, to, you know, have your kids uh, inherit your, your huge debt or sell yourself into slavery, it's not really a fair choice and certainly not everybody um, ought to be put in that position, and, and, and at least I think that that's where maybe some other values come in, like human dignity or you know the right to um, right to life and things like that. So, right. And another problem it seems is in the case of letting someone die because they don't have health care. It seems in that situation, money equals the right to life. Yeah. And like, where does money come in as far as liberty goes? Right, so if you have more money, you have more choices, have more which means liberty. that you have more liberty. Yes. I mean, in, a, in, a, in the sense of being able to have choices. But, of course, I think that a lot of libertarians would probably say, well, that's not really what liberty is about, necessarily having the choices. Liberty is really just being not interfered with. As long as nobody physically harms me, as long as nobody sort of crosses that line, which sort of marks out my, my individual rights, then you're free despite the fact that you have absolutely no options, right? So, and I do think that that's where the second um, conception of liberty comes in, where options are important, right? And so that's one of the things that the welfare state, at least, you know, with all of its imperfections, tries to do is provide everybody with at least some options, right? So you, um, if, you know, your healthcare is taken, if your healthcare is taken care of, then you have options to do something else with your life, right? That provides, it opens up possibilities for you, and I think that that is a part of what freedom uh, ought to be, anyway. And, and but of course, um, you know, the, this is a slightly different conception of, of liberty, and libertarians wouldn't say that that's what it means to be free. Uh, Rousseau gave a, a formula uh, going back to this notion of um, reconciling freedom and equality, and he said that no man should be so wealthy that he could buy another person, and no person should be so poor that they would have to sell themselves. Right. So that's, uh, I guess, one way of thinking about it now. As a point of fact, we live in a world where clearly people have such money and clearly people have such poverty. Yeah. It's actually quite rampant. Like we see things like um, sex tourism, right. where people go to poor countries because there are enough desperate people to get them to do whatever they'd like. Or there's... Um, um, uh, can, the, I, can I give another example, the, actually? There's the, the, the market abroad for surgeries and for organs. For, that's exactly yep. the example I was going to give. And um, another example that I didn't mention was, should we be allowed, because I mean, it was sort of covered by the cannibalism example, but what if we yeah. wanted to sell both liberties? I'm uh, sorry, both liberties. Kidney, kidney, Bo uh, both kidneys. kidneys. Yeah, both yeah. kidneys. Yeah. What if we decided to sell both kidneys? Which is deadly. Which, um, makes which would kill no you. Sense, right? Really, right. right, so if you were to sell both, um, uh, and there was actually a, a real example of this occurring. Um, I, I'm not sure where it was. I think it was India. But somebody did that so that he can pay for his kid's education. That's right. Yeah. Right? And, uh, or at least wanted to. And I'm not sure whether or not he was allowed or not. I remember hearing about this example, but I don't have any specifics. But anyway, um, and I wonder if, if it were legal to do these kinds of things in the United States, how many people would be desperate enough to sell a kidney as, uh, yeah, or both kidneys? Now what's clear here is that the market would depend on desperation. The market would depend on desperation, and it would, uh, it, it would, I think, encourage desperation, right? I mean, it, because it would be able to take advantage of desperation. Here's um, an irony, a deep irony in libertarianism. It assumes individuality and independence, but the logic of liberty leads to these extremes of dependence, and what motivates people to act, ultimately, is a sense of connectedness to other people Right. That they can't even articulate in libertarian terms. Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, why would I sell both of my kidneys? And that's actually a, a, another thing that um, I, I think is important within the idea of liberty is independence, which we haven't yeah. I think, mentioned yet. Yeah, yeah. Being able to be independent, which obviously, if you have to sell, 
a kidney or both kidneys, you're not independent in the in the relevant sense in any meaningful way. Yeah, what I think is interesting is that um, as far as healthcare goes, these medicines were man-made, and then there's the question of who's to decide who has the right to this medical treatment, you know, and then it comes down to um, money. Right. And so it seems. It's like, who is human enough to get this medical treatment since it was made by humans, it was made for humans, now who's human enough to receive it? And it seems to me like money. Money is what makes you human enough. And how is that really fair? You know? Right. Um, and there's a good, I mean, there's a good argument on the libertarian side which says, well, we wouldn't have those at all if we didn't have incentives, if nobody could make the money to be able to, that, that, that they'd be able to make off of selling them at very high prices so that only some people can buy them. So there is a good good case for that. Now the question is, does liberty rely on being able to do that, um, if, if we take that as the central value, or, um, you know, if we can create other kinds of incentives, and, and I think Thomas Paga actually has a different kind, with the uh, uh, Health Impact Fund, um, he has a, 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 a sort of a, a unique, unique way of creating incentives for um, uh, for the pharmaceutical companies to uh, create um, or to to research and develop um, different kinds of medicines that are directed specifically to the poor, right? So, um, in order for that to work, of course, uh, requires a lot of um, ag agreement and a lot of cooperation between different countries and participation in this fund and being able to participate money towards this fund. Uh, but uh, the idea is to create new incentives, right, so that the poor people can get these pharmaceuticals and so that they can actually get these things in, in, in different countries as well as in the United States. So if you can create those incentives, um, and even if that means having to tax the wealthy so that those incentives are there, um, then, then, then should we? And, and of course, the libertarian would say no because taxing would, of course, violate liberty. Uh, so, so it raises that that issue. But I do, I do think that's an interesting uh, uh, point about pharmaceuticals, which are not available uh, to everybody. Clearly, yeah, more money equals more access. Yeah, it seems like you know, generally, poor are deemed less worthy to live than the wealthy. And it just befuddles me, kind of. Why should money even come into play as far as being And also, too, it's like uh, not just uh, having pharmaceuticals available for poor people to have them of equal quality compared to what would be available for those who, quote unquote, had money. So, uh, for had, uh, had money. Right, so. right, right. Yeah. So you're worried about a two tier system. Of right, of uh, quality as well. You know. So, equal access, I think, is important, and that's. Yeah. Uh, the value of equality, I think, is important there. And I think it's really important. I think we should have equal access, or at least as equal as possible access to um, to medicines, the kinds of medicines that would save our lives. Well, you know, there's the Marxist argument that says that um, the way, uh, uh, you talked about incentives, right? that the way goods and services are really produced really depend on collective arrangements. So, for example, pharmaceuticals, in order to develop new drugs, take amazingly huge amounts of money in order to develop them. And that is almost never from a single source. It's almost always the effort of pooling money from many different sources. Right. So if there's a socialized strategy for funding the development of these drugs, shouldn't there be a responsibility to share the fruits of the, of the, of the investment, right. of, the, of you know, the effort? And there's that old issue that the Occupy movement is very interested in of uh, where you have socialization of the costs, the privatization of the, uh, the payoff. Right. You know, um, the risk gets socialized, um, but the profit is privatized. Um, and that's not right. And what you're saying, I think, is that, um, you know, if it, 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 well, part of the consequences with, with pharmaceuticals in particular is life and death. Now, if we make social arrangements to, to produce solutions to life and death issues, Shouldn't we make social um, arrangements to make sure we distribute those resources? Right. It seems reasonable. Right. 